Hello and welcome to the Echo Chamber Podcast. My name is Tony Groves and today we're getting out of the Dublin bubble. Uh, as always, I'm joined by my co-host and the man I personally recommend you should all call if you need someone problematic taken care of, as in taken care of. Uh, Martin, listen, I don't know what you did, but it's great. That trouble's just gone away, mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we have we have the, the boy in the hood today. We're up <laughs> visiting the hood, so we're up in Valley One. Welcome to the show, Luke May. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry it took me so long to, oh, no, no, to delight, turn up, but delight, uh, delighted, uh, delighted to be here now. We know you're fighting the big battle there in the EU, so you, anytime you can give us and when you can fit in, happy to have it. Luke, I'm going to kick us off because the the I remember you wrote a great piece. It was it was in the journal. It was on your own on your own website, and it was about the acceptable opposition, and yeah. about about the face of being the acceptable. So you're all, you're almost in my mind's eye the the face of the unacceptable opposition, <laughs> um, and you know there 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 is that element that where they attach um these maverick, uh, firebrand, troublemaker, and all this. And yet, the, the reality is actually the things you've said were, were, were based on fact, whether it was the Gardaí tackling corruption, where there was, you know, uh, problems in the banks, you know, you, you've been proven raw, uh, true by, the, by, by over time, but you get no credit in, in the mainstream media, shall we say. Um, for me personally, that isn't a problem. And for people like Mick Wallace and Claire Daly, that isn't a problem. But uh, for people like Sergeant McCabe, in the end, he probably felt that he had no choice but to go to Micheál Martin because it's only then would the media accept uh, what he said. And it was only when Micheál Martin uh, stood up in the doll and started talking about uh, this particular horrible situation with Sergeant McCabe, uh, did the media go, OK, we better sit up and listen. And that's dangerous because if someone like Micheál Martin chose to ignore it, then what is a massive issue and one of the country's heroes being uh, the Gardaí attempting to smear him as a paedophile, he would never have been able to even get close to the sort of justice now he probably will get uh, unless he went to basically one of the mainstream parties. And that's not good for democracy because it sends the message out to the voters that, OK, um, I might like Luke Flanagan, I might like Claire Daly, I might like Mick Wallace, but... Uh, Sure, it only happens if we go to Michal Martin. Uh, likewise with uh, Michal Martin and Vera Toomey. Vera Toomey, another hero of mine. But really, uh, the serious push only came when uh, Michal Martin started talking about it. And I suppose uh, that fits into the whole idea of acceptable opposition. And I think that is very dangerous for democracy. I think anyone who gets elected should be listened to and they should be given a chance and uh, if uh, they can't do what they're meant to do, then well, let them uh, let them die on that. But give them a chance. But there's a there's a concerted attack on a section within Leinster House. There's a concerted attack on them um, when they're talking about clothes. We know who they're directing this. They've set up a committee for you know should you be dressed X way in the doll, and we know who that's directed at. That's directed at Mick, and it's directed at other people on the left. Who might be bothered wearing a shirt and tie in, um, but they are elected representatives. They have every entitlement to be in there. And then you have another group within there that are saying, well, we don't like the way you're dressed. You know, what gives them the right to say we don't? I mean, I know if it was me and they said, you have to wear a suit in, I'd turn in book naked every day until they got fed up of it. Well, look, on one hand, they talk about mental health and they talk about respecting people and respecting people who are different, whether that be from uh, the point of view of colour, whether that be from the point of view of sexuality. But it ends at people who decide not to dress in the traditional uniform. And that's wrong because there are so many young people out there and I know them. I used to be one of them. I used to be a cure head. Uh, as uh, Pat, uh, Pat Inglesby said to me the day I went into the doll, I met him on Grafton Street. He goes, at last, we have someone to represent the weirdos. I wasn't <laughs> insulted by that uh, because I've always been a little bit different. Is that because I'm looking for attention? I actually don't like attention that much. Uh, I know people might find that hard to believe, but I actually don't. I like to be on my own an awful lot. But... Um, it just happens to be the way I look and the way I dress uh, captures attention. But you shouldn't be given abuse for that. And I have to say, I loved uh, what something that happened in the European Parliament uh, a couple of months uh, after, got, after I got elected. Uh, I had a member of staff in there. I don't know who they were, 
I don't know what they were about, but they were one of the ushers. And they come up to me and they said, we have had an inquiry from the press about you wearing a T-shirt, uh, an inquiry from Ireland. And I said, who was it from? And they said, we don't know. But what we said to them was, is it's very warm. Of course, he's wearing a T-shirt. It's 30 degrees outside. <laughs> so this idea that it's standard everywhere that you have to dress in a certain way, it actually isn't. It's the normal way people dress. Actually, the exceptions and the people who don't dress the way your average Joe Soap dresses are the people who wear the suits and the doll. And one thing that always uh, uh, confused me was, uh, why do people go around wearing a noose on their neck? What are they trying to tell us? Well, I'm kind it's a of, bit strange. I'm kind of with you on that on ties. Yeah. And also, uh, since biological washing powder was invented, the purpose of the tie is defunct because my understanding of the purpose of a tie is to keep your shirt buttons cleaned. Mm. And that material around it used to be really, really hard to wash. But news for the men in Dáil Éireann who wear a tie, you can use biological washing powder now <laughs> to wash your shirts. Although I get the impression many of the male TDs in Dáil Éireann probably don't wash their own shirts. Well, here, well, so. well, well I tell you, but the, see, I, I, and I, what, what also really grinds my gears, I suppose, is when, when, when you look at the simple things that, that are going on in the European Parliament or in the Dáil, where you take up and you take notice, but specifically, let's talk about the trade agreements. I have a problem in the EU because in the EU we talk about um, there's no EU constitution, okay? So citizens don't have an EU constitution rights yet. We will base everything on trade, okay? So there'll be a trade agreement, and I can only I can only say to you that we was a great admirer of how you stood up against TTIP and and actually trying to bring that to the public's consciousness because it's a hard thing to tell people that oh by the way your rights are about to be watered down in the name of of, of uh, in the name of an yeah. alphabet soup uh, yeah. title and yeah that does make it difficult uh, but uh, i suppose uh, having someone like jeremy o'flynn working uh, with me definitely helped in that case because maybe if he, he hadn't been there that day and when i walked into the office and i said look at i'm just going to walk down to that reading room and i want you to film it it potentially, if there was someone else in the office there, they would have said, mm, no, don't do that. You have a certain job to do here. That might prevent you doing other things. And uh, as a result of it, we just said, let's go for it. And uh, the amount of people uh, who have picked up on it and the amount of people who have listened to it and the amount of people who have taken interest in trade agreements is has been phenomenal as a result of it. Mm. And uh, also uh, as a result of social media as well. And there are new trade agreements going on all the time. Only in the last couple of days, we had the EU, we, the EU, signed a new trade agreement with Mexico. Mm. And we have now agreed to bring in 10,000 tonnes of beef into the EU from Mexico. And uh, I'm sure Mexican beef is fine. But if you're someone over here who is producing beef, you do not have the same requirements in Mexico as you do here. Not only are you farming beef over here when you're producing beef, you've also got to take care of water quality. Some people would say that doesn't always happen, but legally you have to do that. You have to take into account biodiversity. You have to take into account the wages of people here that farmers have to live in that same economy. But at the same time, uh, these trade agreements, whether it be Mercosur, mm. uh, whether it be TTIP, uh, whether it be any of them, uh, they don't take into account the fact that uh, we will end up in a situation where we have people here who will not be able to compete. And actually, why would you want to compete with that? Because we have different aims here. And uh, well, they, it's they, brilliant that people are actually talking about it. Environmental concerns, food safety concerns, um, standards concerns, all of those things are very real. And, you know, people need to understand you're consuming chicken on your pizza from Domino's. And uh, if your if your chicken is, is post T tip, you know it can be genetically modified. It can be whatever. Yes, it yeah. can be, you know your the standards are just so different. Well, it's inter interesting. You should mention pre uh, made food uh, and uh, processed food mm. because you know a lot of people will say when you put out the argument there that we shouldn't be importing this. People will come back to me and say, well, we shouldn't buy it. Why don't we just boycott it? But the problem is you go out there and you get it on your pizza and mm. you haven't a clue where it came from oh. and you just don't know. So the actual consumers can't even uh, make that choice. But 
we don't re uh, people say we've got to get more competitive. Why do we need to get more competitive? How competitive can we get? It's already farming is already an exceptionally dangerous profession. We have any amount of people dying uh, in it in farm accidents. And one of the reasons is, is because they're under massive pressure. Obviously, there's a certain section making money, but about 80 percent of farmers are not making money. And this pressure of more competition, inevitably lower prices means people have to work even harder, uh, cut more corners and you end up with more debts and uh, more problems. And we also have the issue of traceability. For example, with Brazilian beef, we know where it came from, where it was for the last three months, but we wouldn't have a clue where it was before that. Whereas what you're consuming here, you will not only know where it was from birth, you will know where the sperm and the egg came from right the way through. But there are costs to that. And the problem is the costs on that will not be uh, included when they throw that on the same shelves. And what you'll see is a situation where it will wipe out that type of, type of farming in Ireland. And people who live in small towns might say, what's that got to do with me? Well, the reality is an awful lot of money that ends up in small towns trickle downs from, trickles down from what farmers produce. And by the way, I'm a townie. I'm not a farmer. I've never been a farmer and I probably never will be a farmer. But I realise the importance of it. We need to protect our food. We need to protect our food sovereignty. And after that, it's a fairly good start if we mm. got that right. That's right, because like we have a country that boasts that it can feed 50 million Sorry, people yeah. a year. Yes. Yeah, and we have children going to school in food, in food poverty. We have not got that. We have not squared that circle. We have not made this, this to a position where we're actually able to say what we're doing, because what we do is we're now going to um, export beef into China. Yes. And then you're telling me that Mexico are going to export beef to us. And I know this is only a flippant example, but it's very true. Only last week, um, a boxer got a six month suspension for, for, uh, for steroids. But the, the, the excuse and the reason he got a six month suspension as opposed to a two year ban is because I ate Mexican beef. And that, and that passed wash with the USADA, the, the United States anti doping agency. So this 10,000 tons of uh, beef coming in from Mexico means that, uh, you might, you might Europe be, will do well, really, really well, well in the next well, Olympics. Well, the good news is we can all say we're on Clem Bruterall and it was the Mexican beef. Yeah. So. Another thing that you've been very active on, and we had Brian Hayes in here not so long ago, and I asked him straight up about PESCO and about neutrality. And he was, there's no problem here. People are over exaggerating. No, no, no. Neutrality doesn't mean what it used to that's mean. That's right. It's this, this it ridiculous expression we're being told, which is obviously like, you know, that's what you call a linguistic tr trick and it just doesn't hold water. Well, Look, if something is permanent and something is structured and it involves cooperation and it involves all the defence forces or armies from around the European Union, bar uh, Denmark, uh, then what else is it? It is an army. And this isn't just me saying this. We have people like Jean-Claude Juncker describing European defence as a beauty is born. That's how he described it. And I cannot see what is beautiful about us cooperating and buying weapons with uh, other countries around Europe, as in going out there and purchasing them together with them and then coming back and saying we will be safer in this country. Because it isn't as simple as there are good countries and bad countries, mm -hmm. Russia bad, US good, um, uh, Great Britain good, France good. It is not that simple. It is a little bit no more nuanced than that. And we have seen in the last couple of weeks with the US and France and Great Britain bombing Syria that actually we are joining up and linking up with countries who are involved in, as far as I'm concerned, war crimes and involved in uh, battles that aren't necessarily about human rights, but are about territory and about oil. And we're getting involved in a situation where we're getting involved with countries that say we can bomb a country because they use chemical weapons. Whereas at the same time, they say, I oh, will try and build uh, friendly relations with Saudi Arabia, even though Saudi Arabia is using chemical weapons in Yemen. Yeah, yeah, so exactly. um, the idea that cooperating with countries that have a history 
of colonization and a bad history when it comes to human rights definitely won't make this country safer. And what really worries me is that you have well, they're called the progressives, the S and D, the socialists and the Democrats in the European Parliament. And you have members from that group. One particular member stood up and said that defense should become our most ambitious project. Now, that to me terrifies me because, look, at I am a skeptic. But when it comes to the agricultural policy, I'd be more of a Europhile. And I actually think our main project should be food. And at a time when we're moving towards common defence, we now have a new common agricultural policy that's based on subsidiarity, where it's all going to be decided back in the home country. So we're moving away from a common policy on food, which is more important, and we're now going to have a common policy on defence and war. Well, I uh, do not like that. All six scenarios on the future of Europe's white paper, all six scenarios included PESCO. Yes, yeah. Uh, and so even if even if we water down the future... Well, all five. Uh, there were originally five, but uh, uh, you, you're right to say six, because uh, before we made a decision in this future of Europe process, Jean-Claude Juncker decided to come out and tell us you can have any... W any any number so long as it's younger, basically, <laughs> yeah. and he picked a sixth yeah. uh, 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 scenario. Path. Yeah, and uh, okay, people might like like might might not like Jean Claude Juncker. I'm no big fan of his, but at least he stood up and said, "That's what I want. I want a united Europe. I want full fiscal union. I want an army, etc." And that's the direction he wants to go. I know. Really, that's the way Fine Gael want to go, but they ain't telling us that. Okay. It'd be nice if they well, stand up and say they have told us that. They have told us that. Because well, it depends what interview. No, because no, because he, Leo Varadkar said we want to stand with our allies. That was a very Blairite thing to say. Yes, that yeah. was a complete and utter Tony Blairism. It was we stand with our allies, and all we were all we were short of is the the special partnership or something being said, you know. Yeah, and, yeah. and special that, relationship, special yes. relationship, and and we're getting very close to that language now. So we think we, they want that. They, I think that that's where where this is going. Well, let let's say you you were like if you if you have a look at it and look at what Ireland could add to a European army. Let's say you were into that. I mean, how much can we add? How much actual real practical difference would we make on the battlefield? Let's say there is a battlefield. Whereas if we look at it from another perspective, if we actually embellish our neutrality and go further with our neutrality, then potentially we can offer something because while we're neutral and while we have expertise in not completely solving a, a, a conflicts, but going a long way to solving a conflict in, in Northern Ireland. We are knowledgeable and we are experts in this and the world trusts us on this. So why not use those skills? And one example that was given to me of a benefit of remaining neutral would be that um, in the conflict uh, between Israel and uh, the Palestinians, uh, the, uh, the conflict that uh, I would basically blame on Israel, if there is talking to be done. They don't ring warmongers to see how they can get them to talk to each other. They ring Norway That's and right. they see, can they get Norway to talk to each other? Yes. So surely we would add more in that role than we would in throwing a couple of, a couple of billion euros, massive amount of money to us. But in the overall scheme of things, it wouldn't make us a bigger military might in the European Union. So what the hell are we doing it for? Well, we could be. The honest broker. And yes. that's, that's, that's what we've always played is the honest broker. Even times when we want to work on the honest bit first. Yeah. But. Well, we've been dishonest at <laughs> yeah. times. And, but we have played the neutrality game and we have been neutral on our terms, which was very quietly not neutral in a lot of t circumstances. But we weren't out there up front saying, no, we're not neutral. We had this accommodation that the rest of the world bought into that we were neutral, but we were kind of neutral on your side if you were on so held the same values. Yes, yeah. So Whereas now, now we have now, gone hook, line and sinker for not only do we uh, support uh, sanctions on Russia, not only do we, uh, do we do that, but we want to be seen to be leading the way with uh, Mr. Macron in expelling Russian diplomats. And look at 
I wouldn't like to live under uh, Vladimir Putin's rule. And you certainly wouldn't want to live under his rule if you were a homosexual. But what they're doing is not making that situation any worse. What I actually believe they're doing is they are getting a state that has a lower combined GDP uh, uh, of Belgium and the Netherlands together. And you're putting them up as a pedestal as somehow they are a massive, massive world power. There are other countries out there that have nuclear weapons, but we are not going, oh, they're the bogeyman all the time and actually building up his credibility within his own country. Because if you were the opposition in Russia, you have a hard enough time without the making him seem, making it the, the, the world's supposedly good countries, uh, NATO, etc., making it seem that somehow yeah, he's made them a power again. So that has to make them popular at home. But the, uh, I think it's that that Russia has the 25th biggest economy in the world. I think it was the 25th mm -hmm. biggest. So it's not a superpower, not by any means yeah. anymore. And what they're doing is setting up a, a, a bogeyman over there that they can all, you know, you need to be, you need a nemesis. You need somebody to be scared yeah. of. But the big point about... It's Pesco, like James Bond, isn't yeah. it? The big point for PESCO about me was that future spending on weapon weapons... They have to take priority over your homeless spending, over your hospitals. It has to take priority over everything. Well, the idea else. is to bring it. The idea is to bring it up to two percent spending. But there is a, a, there is people going to be used in this debate, and they are going to use them uh, uh, by saying, "Well, look." Uh, the army doesn't get treated very well by who? By the government. But yeah. this is what they're going to say. They are um, under equipped. Uh, they could maybe do with more money being put into training, etc. And if we uh, join up with, when we join up with PESCO, all that will be done. So they're going to use people in the Irish army who they have abused for years, underpaid. There's a lot of, our, uh, there's people a lot of soldiers sleeping on in, in cars uh, at night uh, because basically... Uh, they can't afford uh, to get where they're going. They have to stay the night in their car. They basically are on family income supplement, mm -hmm. etc. And what PESCO is going to be used as now is, well, sure, look at, we'll make conditions better for you. And then we'll be able to say, sure, the Irish army are on side. And uh, on that issue of people being on side uh, and in favour of a European army, I firmly believe that the Irish population and the Irish people don't believe in it. But Federica Mogherini has said that she knows of surveys that say we are in favour of it. That white paper on the future of Europe references the fact that all EU states are overwhelmingly in favour of more European defence. I have now asked four separate questions of the Commission on it. The first question, they said the answer is in is in the data in the attachment. It was not in the data. Everyone in my office looked through it. We sent back another question looking for disaggregated data. They didn't give it to us. I followed Federica Mogherini to a meeting and she promised to give it to me. It still hasn't arrived. Now we've sent in our fifth question. So you'd have to ask this. If they are so sure that we're that in favour of it, show me the proof. And if the proof was that easy to find, I'd see it if it ran down my throat oh, at this yeah. stage. There's an, there's Instead, an, they can't find it. The dog ate the survey. There's an easy way to, 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 to dismiss that actual claim because when the Future of Europe paper came out and these town halls were to happen all over the EU and they, they were happening all over the EU, when we had our first big song and dance about it, uh, they walked into Trinity and they took microphones off journalists and there was, uh, Leo Varadkar showed That's up. Right. And if you remember, there was, there was this, uh, and literally we, and it was nine months after the first one was supposed to take place. Yes, yeah. We were late to the party. We were ramming them through. Well, they were meant to start in March and there was meant to be a process that they were meant to be finished by September. Mm. That gave countries, their member states, the opportunity to have a look at what we decided. And if you watch the process closely and you listen to Jean-Claude Juncker and you listen to various actors on that stage, they kept shifting the goalposts. In fact, at the last European Parliament plenary in Strasbourg, Jean-Claude Juncker announced that there had been 500 meetings. A few months previously, he announced that there had been 2,000 meetings. So over a couple of month period, they lost 1,500 meetings and they can't find them anymore. 
Now, I had a situation where I had a group of teachers uh, come over and visit us in the European Parliament. We get lots of people visit us, but it happened to be teachers on this day. And I went in and I met with them. Now, I didn't realise there was a European Commission official in the room. Mm. I brought up uh, the white paper on the future of Europe because these were teachers and I wasn't trying to catch them out. I said, had you heard about the process? And they said, no. And they were kind of a bit embarrassed. And I said, no, you shouldn't be embarrassed. I says, I live in a bit of a bubble. I'm an anorak on this. I says, of course I would uh, know about it. But it's a bit strange. Do you not think that you didn't hear about any of these debates? So then this individual from the corner of the room pipes up and says, well, actually, I think that's a little bit disingenuous of you. And I thought to myself, OK, have I got this wrong? He goes, actually, you were invited to a meeting. And I thought, oh, <laughs> no, I was invited to a meeting. And I went, thought to myself, OK, I'm not perfect. We're all capable of being disingenuous, but I was not being disingenuous here. So we went on to explain that I had been sent an email about it that Commissioner Andrea Kytus was at it and that uh, I didn't go. So I left the meeting with, uh, I don't have a tail, but it was well between my legs and I went off and I checked my diary and I discovered this meeting. Mm. But this meeting was not about the future of Europe. It was specifically about food safety. And it was a meeting between the first vice president, let's give her her correct title because you wouldn't want to not give her a correct title. Mairead McGuinness was there and Mr. Andrea Kytus. And they were talking about food safety. So even when I called out the fact that I didn't know when any of these meetings were taking place, I was not told the truth by a commission representative. And if you're trying to build trust and belief in the European Union and what it's going to look like in 2025 when all my kids will be pretty much grown up or on the way to being grown up, well, it's a bit worrying, you'd have to say, because it isn't much of a consultation process, really. And you, you've, I've seen recently, you've been chasing people in the, in the EU over the fake news panel that has been set up within the yes, EU. Yes, the high level committee. <laughs> now, now, before, before we get into this, I, I'm just going to put it the way I see it. This is the same shower who were paid to put advertising by government into the newspapers to pretend it wasn't advertising to fool people. And now they've appointed this purveyor of fake news as the fake news representative within the EU who works for Dennis O'Brien. Yes. And this is what's meant to prevent fake news. Now, you're one of these people in the EU that we never hear from anymore. And it's really, it really bothers me. You turn on any of the, the national channels, you turn on RT, you turn on Dinny Bot Radio, and you have Brian Hayes sitting there. Day yeah. in, day out. It is fake news by omission. That's what it is. You're not there. Matt Carthy's not there. Lynn Boylan's not there. I, the other voices, what I call the reasonable voices, not the neo, neoliberal voices, completely excluded. So how does that feel for you? The same organisations that are excluding you from having a voice in Ireland are now deciding whether you are or are not fake news going forward. Well, it's uh, it sort of started off with the in the in the plenary in the in the European Parliament uh, chamber with the discussion about uh, Russia today, and uh, unfortunately, I didn't manage to get speaking time in that debate. I, I would have loved to because. At the time that debate uh, was on, I had, during my mandate as an MEP, got more invites to appear on Russia Today than I did on uh, the other RTE, RTE, <laughs> or national broadcasters. So, look, at I know Russia Today isn't perfect and anything but perfect, but they gave me an opportunity to talk. They didn't edit uh, my contribution. They put it out for a baton. I can't really complain about that. Whereas uh, the supposed purveyors of true news, RTE, I never, ever get a look in. And I'm waiting for them at the next European elections to ask me, where was I? And it'll be a bit like someone who went out there and kidnapped someone and let the, then let them off after five years and then went around going, 
where's your man been for five years? And I turn around and go, well, actually, you kidnapped me, like, you know, uh, why sitting, are you asking where sitting, was I? Sitting in the cellar. Um, I heard a great quote. Um, they asked an academic uh, in the in the US last week um, what was, what to explain propaganda around the fake news phenomenon because it was just propaganda. Let's tell the truth here. Um, just this, this calling it fake news just became a Trumpian buzzword. But, um, and the academic said, I'm not going to give you a satisfactory answer because what, what she said was, and I can't remember the lady's name, but she was wonderful. She just said, she gave this thing and she said, she said, propaganda is what my opponents do. Persuasion is what I do. Yeah. And perfect. I thought, and it is perfect. It's yeah. absolutely perfect because the simple fact of the matter is there, it, depending on what side of the aisle you sit, that's where you're going to, that's where you're going to uh, row in behind. But what we have is, is, um, an imbalance. It's not a, it's not, that's not an either or. It's actually eighty percent in favor of the of the. But the but the biggest fake news of all time is the idea that fake news is new. Yeah, right? yeah. That is ridiculous. Ever since Mary and Johnny told lies about their neighbors and spread it around town, there has been fake news. And there is a statue in Strasbourg, and I suggest the MEPs go down and have a look at it. It's from Gothenburg, the inventor of the printing press. Yeah. The day the printing press was invented, it was a license for fake news. Well, he printed a and, Bible. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> well, look, it was a license for fake news if people felt like spreading fake news. And there has always been fake news. And one person's fake news is another person's truth. And, like, it depends on what your point of view is. Now, there's obviously stuff that's blatantly uh, wrong, but uh, it depends on where you're where you're coming from. But the best way to deal with fake news is to educate people, mm. teach people how to read and write, and let people decipher the truth from for themselves. And I do that by watching, God help me, said the atheist, RTE, RT, um, uh, press TV. I watch them all and then I make yes. up my own mind. And I've worked out from watching them all that they're all lying to me a little bit. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you just your, use your own common sense to establish what is the truth. And it's, it's difficult at times, but that's always the way it is. You've been. gotten nowhere chasing this. You've been asking about the process that mm. ended up with, with, yes, with the, what we call nowhere yet. Stephen, Stephen Ray. But, but, you've been questioning the process. How did this happen? And for something that should be fairly above board, you're not getting any replies back. You're not getting well, any replies. Uh, no, hang on, sorry. And then you have to deal with the fact that INM have gone to the courts this in the last week and said, thank you, Mr. Um, uh, uh, Office of the Director of Consumer uh, Corporate Enforcement. Yes. Yeah. And uh, thank you for pointing out that we had a data breach, but we'll deal with it now. Yeah. And two <laughs> thumbs up and go away. Yeah. And you're like, Really? You know, like really, no, servers taken well, from the biz from the building. We're taking, uh, we're taking a, a long look at this. We're we're not basically just going to have a look at it and then go, okay, we tried and we leave it there. We currently have a freedom of information request in on uh, Mr. Ray's uh, job application. We also have put in questions directly out of that Anne Harris article, the brilliant article yes. that, uh, that she wrote. And when we get answers to those questions, I will establish where Mariah Gabrielle is at her next committee meeting and we will go in there and we will question her again because her angle on it now is that actually the fake news committee has, high level committee has reported and the job is done. But actually, if you dig down into it, there is potential for them to do something between now and December. So on one hand, we're being told, oh, this is all over. And OK, I know you're not happy with the appointment, but it's kind of irrelevant it's now. But on the other hand, officially, this committee is still there till December. And some people would say to me, at the end of all of this, if nothing is done about it, have you failed? I would say, no, I haven't failed. I will have established uh, what had happened. I will I will have established that the European Union and Mariah Gabrielle is not willing to do anything about it. And then let people decide what they think of the European Union on that basis. And I, look, at, I'm not doing that purely just to get people to turn them off the European Union. 
I will sing lots of good songs about the common agricultural policy. I will sing lots of good songs about the potential for the European Union to actually do something about tax dodging, etc., etc. But if it doesn't do the right thing, it's got to be shown up. It's got to be highlighted. And OK, if they don't change now, it may provide a catalyst at the next European elections for people to run and more people to go in there and try and change it. And rather than saying, Asher, what's the point? He's banging his head against a brick wall. Put a few more people in there to bang their head against that brick wall and it will fall. You're one of our busiest MEPs and you are by far one of our busiest MEPs. And they did at one stage try and, and say that you didn't... Uh, sign in and sign out. What's the point in having MEPs if they don't turn up? Yeah, quote unquote? Yes, yeah, you remember all of that. And they had to issue an apology. I never, I, I, well, actually, it's it's interesting you should say that. They haven't had to interest, uh, uh, as a result of what was reported about me since I became an MEP, the Irish Times and Susan and Lynch don't have to issue an apology because what they wrote was factually correct. But if you actually drill down into the detail of it and you look at when they wrote it, you would just have to conclude that it was unfair because they wrote about a period between due, between May and December of 2014 at the beginning of my mandate. We did not start until July. We had one meeting. Then we had the August break and then we had two more meetings and then the article was written. My wife was pregnant and had a difficult pregnancy, so I made the decision, and I make it every time to be there for her and my children, to stay with her. I missed three months. I actually had one of my APAs ring me and say, Luke, they're going to attack you if you don't come in. And I says, I know what's important. I knew what was important. So this article was written. Myself and Brian Crowley, who is very ill and can't turn up for work, was included in the article and it suggested what's the point in having MEPs if they don't turn up for work. But what has not happened since is that has not been updated. And if you Google attendance and Luke Ming Flanagan, you will get an article saying I don't turn up. When in fact, the truth is, when it comes to roll call votes, since that time when I returned to work, no one has a higher percentage voting record. And even if you include that time, I am second of the 11 Republic of Ireland MEPs, but that has not been reported by the paper of record. And I don't get upset by a lot. I have grown a very, very thick skin, but a minimum of two times a week, I have to sit down and I have to reply to someone and tell them, no, you're wrong. I do turn up to work. And usually they come back and say they're sorry. And I say, no, don't be sorry because you read it. And sure, look at you read it. So why wouldn't you believe it? And it isn't your job to apologise to me or say you're sorry. It's the job of the paper of record to update what they originally wrote. And this is the the question of credibility. We're back to exactly where we started. The the unacceptable opposition. We're back to exactly where we started. There were other... You have the second best best record of Irish. Well, 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 there was there was another one where 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 you were said you voted for a hard border when you when like, I mean this is this is the sort of nonsense you have to put up with. Where whereas and this happens in the doll. I never day. I never forget it. I was walking along the corridor outside the uh, the the chamber, and Brian Carty, uh, a man uh, in uh, GUI NGL, the group that I'm in in the European Parliament, also a Sinn Fein member, comes up to me and he goes, "Why did you vote that way?" And I looked at him, I says, what, Brian? He goes, you didn't, you voted in a sense for a hard border. I says, no, I didn't. I said, let me have a look at the voting list. And I look at the voting list and I went, oh my God. I said, can I change it? Because I wasn't really 100% sure whether I could change it. He said, you can change it. And I changed it immediately. And it didn't, uh, didn't stop the... Uh... No, no, it didn't. And it was suggested that, uh, what a silly thing to do. And then fortunately, there's an army of people out there found out a few things from me. Someone sent me a private message and said, hey, look at the list of Irish MEPs who had to change their vote. Yes. Actually, you're one of the lowest amount of change votes. And even that wasn't the truth, really, because actually the person who changed the most votes was Leon Arida. 
And it wasn't because Lee Narida is incompetent. In fact, Lee Narida is the other end of the spectrum to incompetent. She's the most competent MEP I have ever met out there. The reason why she had the most changes was because she went off and checked to see did she make any mistakes. She was wary that she made mistakes. And the reason why she had the most corrections was is because she was always checking it. And now I check it a bit more often because you could potentially, and I kid you not, vote a couple, a thousand times in an afternoon session. Yeah, Dermot is and telling me it can just it fly. Is, uh, it's complicated. Uh, so so um, that option to change the vote is a very good one. So could, sure, look at inevitably, they, this is what a bully does. And I've known it from school and I've known it all my life. A bully will highlight your failings and they will ignore your achievements. It is always the case. So be it. Well, can I, can I bring it on then to, 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 towards, you, you talked about going back into the, you, you know, going back in. So, so I take it that you're going to run again for, for, as an MEP. I am indeed, yeah. And, and so uh, European project itself, I know you just said you can be a bit of a Europhile. I'd be more, I'm probably more. More of a Eurosceptic. No, no, I'd be more, I'd, 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 I'd advocate for more inclusivity, but I'd, I'd put people at the centre of it as opposed to trade agreements at the centre yes, of it. Yes, yeah. yes. So I think the direction of the EU has been, um, firmly in favour of multinationals, corporations, and, yes. and then, um, integration in terms of, of trade links as opposed to putting the people at the middle of it. So people like you give me hope that, that actually we can, we can shake up the system and maybe kick a few people up the arses and, and bring raise a bit of awareness but i'm probably more i, I think i'm more optimistic than you are well look at I, i'm optimistic in in certain senses uh in that uh the like the one about do politicians cooperate together i do see an awful lot of cooperation on the agriculture committee no matter i put it like this it turns out i have the same opinion pretty much on the common agricultural policy as the group that fina gale are in but Fine Gael are the radicals in it, in that in the EPP, they actually believe in redistributing uh, the cat money, whereas actually Fine Gael don't. But in other senses, I would be pessimistic and I'd be pessimistic uh, uh, about the future of the European Union. And like we hear about how the threat from the far right has been beaten. And we hear about it because Marine Le Pen didn't win in France. And we hear about it because uh, your man in the Netherlands yeah, didn't win. Yeah. But they seem to forget about the fact that Marine Le Pen and the guy in the Netherlands, they never, ever got a higher vote. They seem to forget about the fact that you now have the disregard states, Slovenia, Slovakia, Austria and Hungary getting together, uh, organizing and being very clear. We don't like foreigners and we don't like immigrants. So this idea that... You know, it's that problem Crisis solved America, and it's yeah. gone away is delusional. And I actually think the way to solve that problem is for Germany, which runs a massive budget surplus, start spending it around Europe. Because mm. if they're actually serious about a united Europe and they're serious about full fiscal union, etc., it can't be a full fiscal union that's based on zero transfer of wealth. Because in the United States of America, at least you do have transfer of wealth between states. It can't be based on that. But that's the one that they want us to get into. And I want nothing to do with that. I think we should retain our sovereignty when it comes to deciding our own taxes, retain our sovereignty when it comes to our own defence and our neutrality, work together on issues such as climate change, work together on issues such as net neutrality, work together on issues such as food sovereignty and... That's what we should be working together on. And that's something that you get the support of the people on rather than working together on war, working together on basically destroying things by basically uh, turning people into resources, competing against people in Brazil to produce what they've produced here for generations. Well, it's, instead of a, a European project, we have a neoliberal project really is what's going we on. We really do, yeah, yes. It's a neoliberal. We do. What about the home? You've You've been out of... Irish politics now for quite a while. You and you say you're in a bubble there in the EU, but you're looking back in at this bubble. What do you see looking back in at the bubble? That's the first part. And when are you coming back to us? Well, uh, I was asked by uh, Sean O'Rourke during the election, and I suppose it's obvious it was during the election because I haven't been on the show since. He hasn't invited me. 
Hi, Sean. Uh, but <laughs> I was asked the question, uh, would I do my full term? And I did the kind of the politicians thing because I wasn't definite. I really wasn't definite. I had to say uh, I ran for Europe really as an experiment to get a debate going on what the European Union was about. A side effect to that was that I got elected. And at the time, I wasn't quite sure whether I'd try and do the full term in Europe and maybe I might have ran in the next general election. And obviously I didn't. And since then, I've been back to Dáil Éireann a couple of times. And on one occasion, and a, a great occasion, was for Gino Kenny's uh, bill. And that was good in itself. But I met a few of the new TDs with their with their uh, designer outfits, etc. Manufacturers. And, and, I, and I saw how excited they were about the fact that there were TDs, but not excited about the fact that they could do something for people as TDs. See, we do miss you. And we I got that you. sickening feeling that... Do you know what? I cannot wait to get out of this bloody building and get on the road home because I have to say it didn't feel like a nice place to be in any sense. So will you ever see me there again? Uh, who knows? Who knows? And it's not easy getting into Dáil Éireann and you've got to get elected there. Well, so there that's any, another thing. Well, you there, never know. There was but, a rumour swelling around that if Bertie stood for the presidency that you'd throw your hat in the ring. Did you hear that rumour? Yeah, I kind of I kind of spread that rumour. But <laughs> I, I, I think, uh, I think, uh, I, I think Bert, Bertie put an end to that rumour with his he did. wonderful interview with, uh, well, just a regular reporter that asks people questions. Uh, but apparently it was some sort of an amazing... Uh, it's deep reporter that asked him the bloody obvious question but after that uh, I don't think I'll be running in the presidential election but have a look out for um, uh, 2048 uh, I'm going to uh, I'm, 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 I'm going to if I'm still around uh, going to try a hundred years after a Castle Reman Douglas Hyde I'm going to try and repeat his feat well we wish you the best of luck with that and we're very glad you're batting for us in the EU and some of us miss you terribly in the door. We do miss you. Well, you thank you. you. That's you. the biggest compliment I've ever been paid by people. People go, oh, we'd love to see you back in the doll. And I'm like going, you know, because you look in the mirror and you see your nose and your two eyes and your teeth and your face and your ears and you go, oh, whatever, I'm Luke Flanagan. And then you have people going, oh, we wish you were back in the doll. That for me is, I know it's Vincent Brown and go, what do you mean humbling? It is <laughs> bloody, it is bloody humbling. It really is, because you're like going, but you're our Jedi. Why me? You know, like? That's it. Yeah. You are our Jedi. Uh, you, you, we, we quite like Luke, our Jedi. Yeah, we, I should have called myself Luke Skywalker. <laughs> no, uh, yeah. Ming the Merciless. <laughs> Luke, we know you're busy. We know you have a lot on the plate and we appreciate you coming in and it's great to, it's great to sit down Thanks with you. Thanks for coming in. Um, Pleasure. And, uh, yeah. look, and we'll know, do it again. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And we'll even, we'll bring Dermot in another time and we'll, we'll, we'll have, we'll have a, bit, a bit of a, a bit of a, Powell then, you know? And you probably worked out when you asked me a question, uh, you've got to tell me to shut up before you get to ask, ask another one. I so, know, that's certain. Uh, we like when people talk on this. <laughs> we right. love when people Good. talk. Right, Good. right, guys. Thanks for listening. Uh, make sure you tell your friends, hit subscribe, leave us a review. Uh, follow us on Twitter. Send us an email to the echo chamber at gmail.com. And uh, thanks again.